Good morning, everyone, and I hope we are all doing well. I want to welcome all of you again to our series of today. And the series of for today is consecrated to the general introduction into phenomenology. You remember that in our last series, we did uh, consider the course description. We did look at the nature of our program, phenomenology. We saw the course content. We defined the course objectives as well as the expected outcome. And then today we're going to continue with uh, the general introduction, general introduction into phenomenology into this program and I would like to begin by saying that phenomenology um, is situated in the 20th is the 20th century philosophy 20th century philosophy and therefore when we get this that's that's the period from the historical dimension that should come into our mind that is not to say that the word phenomenology was used only from the 20th century Prior to the 20th century, there have been philosophers who have used the word phenomenology. But when we talk of uh, phenomenology as, as a discipline or as a philosophical movement, we are situating it in the 20th, 20th century with uh, um, Edmund Husserl. And then within the 20th century still, there were some uh, <clears throat> philosophical trends philosophical trend is like we could have a triangle maybe just imagine just imagine as as you listen to me a triangle in front of you um one side of the triangle you have phenomenology um the other side you have existentialism and then on top of the triangle you have analytical philosophy analytical philosophy so this these are um the tree or the trinity the philosophical trinity if you want of the 20th century particularly dominating the english world dominating the german and the french world this was the, the key philosophical trends of this of this epoch of this era you have as i've mentioned you have phenomenal phenomenology on the one hand you have um existentialism on the other and then you have analytical philosophy and there is there is there is an impact on each of these in other words you have an impact on existentialism by phenomenology you have an impact on phenomenology by existentialism you have an impact on analytical philosophy by existentialism or by phenomenology and vice and vice versa and then when you go, when you go the other way you can we can have an impact on um, phenomenology by analytical philosophy and an impact on analytical philosophy by phenomenology. That is the reason why if we um, go back to Introduction to Phenomenology by Demot Moran, that's, that's a document published in 2000, we're going to see that there, there are divergent perspectives of phenomenology. There are some philosophers who have been known to be existentialists, that we study them, we examine them as well in, in the phenomenology. There are, there are others that are analytical philosophers that um, we study them as well in, in phenomenology. So it is, it is because of, it is because of this um, perspectives, this um, um, trinity that we understand the trinity, we can understand the various perspectives and the various reasons why we have, um, um, of, uh, that's, that's philosophers of, of language studied under um, phenomenology and philosophers of existentialism studied under uh, phenomenology. It is because of this um, triangle which I've made mention of. Again, you have phenomenology on the one hand, you have um, um, existentialism on the other, and then on top you have um, analytical philosophy. So that is where I am making this general introduction from, that's from the 20th century. 20th century philosophy that so that we can understand that from the historical perspective so when we talk about when we talk about phenomenology it's not as if it is something that is far removed from us it is not as as if it is some kind of an abstract an abstract science that has nothing to do with our day-to-day -day life the first from from Husserl 
who is considered as the founder of uh, phenomenology, that's Edmund Husserl. Phenomenology is the study of the structures of, of consciousness as, as experienced from the first person um, point of view. The, the study of the structures of consciousness as experienced from, that's the front seat, front seat uh, perspective. So what is important here is that it is the, it is the lived um, character perspective that justified the first person point of view approach emphasized in phenomenology because perhaps you're going to get you're going to get us saying from time to time about the first person experience first person experience means like um um let's say i have an encounter with some with with an event and i come and narrate that event to you then you are not the first person you don't have the first person experience of that event i have the first person experience of that event and phenomenology is advocating for that first person encounter first person experience or you can have a front seat i i i, I like to say this a front seat view of something not like maybe people are sitting at the back seat they have they have a view of something the person at the front has a better view of that because the person has perhaps a direct encounter with that thing so as, as i said before phenomenology as as as, as, a, as a science as as a discipline is an everyday life um activity it is it is everyday life activity it's not as if it is something that um something for the classroom or something for the philosophers it is it's an everyday life activity so when we talk of it as um, as a discipline, as, as I said, we can either look at phenomenology as, as a philosophical movement or phenomenology as a discipline. When we talk about um, um, phenomenology from the everyday life point of view, everyday life point of view, perhaps before I go to make a distinction between phenomenology as as a discipline or phenomenology as a movement let me just briefly say that um phenomenology as i as i as i was indicating is um every day it's an everyday life activity it's an it's an everyday life activity not some abstract kind of thing not something reserved for the philosophers or the students of of philosophy as as, as the case could be so let me just give the following example so that you you get to understand what I'm saying when we talk about phenomenology as um, every as an everyday life activity or experiences. Let me just give this example. Maybe for those of us who are who are Catholics, I say that I see that chalice during consecration raised by the presiding priest every day I attend mass. That's the first example. I see that chalice during consecration raised by the presiding priest. Every day I attend um, mass. Then the second example, the second example I want to give to you um, is been taken from ground zero. Maybe those also are in, in what is called today ground zero will understand better. I say that I hear gunshots from Molang and rendezvous neighborhoods in Baminda. I hear gunshots from Molang and rendezvous neighborhoods in Baminda. And those of you who are in the Southwest region, perhaps you can you can, you can have the same experience of some um, hot um, areas within this conflict. And you can say, for instance, I hear I hear those gunshots from a corner um, in Boya. The third example is, I am thinking that phenomenology is distinct from ontology i am thinking that phenomenology is distinct from ontology the food i wish i had some ice cream i wish i have some ice cream from j4b bakery now i wish i had some ice cream from j4b bakery now then um 
let's let me just give one other last example and then we can we can, we can proceed from there um i intend to finish writing my assignment on uh, phenomenology by this weekend i intend to finish writing my my assignment in phenomenology by this weekend these are these are examples these are examples that um i have maybe just pick them from our everyday life day-to-day -day life um encounter and each of the, the above um sentences is a simple form of phenomenological description articulating the structure of the type of of experience described so when we talk about having an experience from the first uh, person um, encounter or first person point of view we, we are not only talking about maybe seeing something um it can be it can be hearing for instance look at the example that i that i give i see that chalice there is that subject i then i see the the phenomenological experience there is that of sight then in the second example which i give i see, i hear those those gunshots the the phenomenological experience there is of course that of hearing i hear those gunshots from molang and rendezvous neighborhoods in in Bamenda. then I, I i i the third one look at the third i am thinking i am thinking so the phenomenological experience there is is that of uh, perception is is that of thought that of perception i am thinking that phenomenology is distinct from ontology and then look at look at the thought i wish i wish i had some um ice cream we have that desire there that desire which we have so it is it is within this context that we're saying that each of the above sentences um in the examples that we have given above is a simple form of phenomenological description articulating the structure of the type of experience described take for instance in the above in the above um there is that subject term there are all of those all of those um um, statements which we have given above has a subject term i i that's the first person the first person and then there is the structure of 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 the experience the structure of the experience as i as i said before the structure of the experience can can either be um seeing i see the charlies it, it can either be hearing i hear gunshots um it could be as well um thinking thinking it could be as well volition wish i wish i had some ice cream um it could even be as well as well intention i intend i intend the desire i intend to finish writing my my dissertation or my um um assignment in phenomenology by um this 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 weekend so we have the the subject term then there is the first person um structure this the subject i that's the first person and then we have the structure of of the experience as as as, as uh, demonstrated in the the examples which i've given above then there is that intentionality intentionality is that a kind of a mental relationship between um the, the mind and the object that's subject object relationship subject object relationship which is not a kind of a physical but uh, immaterial but spiritual like when you say um when you say for instance i see that chalice during consecration raised by the presiding priest every day i attend mass th th there is i there that's the person um involved in the experience there's the nature of the experience which is seen and then there is that chalice that chalice here is is the object is the object of of the perception is the object so that um that rapport that relationship between the eye and that object we refer to it in the phenomenology as intentionality so there is the intentionality which proceeds from the subject because to see 
um, is to see something. I see that chalice. To hear is to hear something. To think is to think something. To wish is to wish for something. To intend is to intend something. So the moment I say, I see, you're going to ask me what? That what now is the object of my perception. And then the relationship between that that I and which is a subject and the object of, of perception as I've indicated is, is referred to in a um, phenomenology as um, intentionality. And then in those examples which I've given, there is the verb and the verb indicates indicates the type of the intentional activity described it could be the intentional activity described it could be perception as i said before it could be thought it could be imagination and then we have uh, the direct object of expression the direct object you know express it could be that chalice now, in from those examples which I gave to you, it could be that chalice which I see at mass every day, raised, elevated by the presiding priest. It could be those gunshots which I hear uh, from Molang every time I pass there, um, around Efu in Bamenda. Um, so this object articulates the mood of the of presentation of the object in the experience, the mode of presentation of the object in the experience. It is important that we're, we're, we're saying this because um, quite often when we say that phenomenology is the study of the structures of consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view, um, quite often people look at it to, to narrow it maybe only from thoughts, experience that have to do only with thinking, experiences that have to do only with thinking. But if you look at the five examples which I have given, you will discover that it is quite broader than that. There are experiences that have to do with, with seeing, with sight, those with hearing, those with thinking, those with wish, as, 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 as the case could be. Now, we're living from that, from that um, description of... Uh, um, phenomenology as the study of the structures of consciousness as, as experience from, from the first person point of view. Remember that I'm giving these examples to demonstrate that phenomenology is, is, is not abstract. Um, the phenomenological experiences are day-to-day, day-to-day uh, events or encounters which um, we have. And from the examples that I've given, you can as well give multiple examples you are on examples uh, remember quite often that when we have understood something and we can taste our our understanding of a given thing based on the numerous of examples that we can give from those from that event our own examples that we can give from it so we're living from there from from that um, from that point to indicate that phenomenology could be considered as a discipline Phenomenology could be considered as a philosophical movement that's of the 20th century. So as a discipline, phenomenology is seen as a study of the structures of experience or consciousness. That's from the first person point of view. Of course, that's what um, Edmund Husserl, the father of phenomenology, had in mind. So it is, it is, it is the study of phenomena as a discipline. Phenomenology is um, phenomenology is dedicated to the study of phen phenomena. It is the study of appearances of things, or things as they appear in our experience. And remember that when I talk about our experience here, please do not narrow this experience to sight. It can be an experience of it could be thinking, it could be hearing, it could be any other kind of of experience that that we come that we have that is not only about sight so when we say that phenomenology is a discipline that's what you should have in mind that it is it is it studies the structures of experience or consciousness because to be conscious is to be conscious of something what thing 
that thing now becomes the object of our experience so it is it is the study of phenomena or appearances of things or things as they appear in our in our experience phenomenology as a discipline revolves around the meaning that we give to our experience you know to to be to be conscious is to be conscious of something what thing so there is a meaning that we give to that to hear is to hear something what thing there is a meaning that we give to our object to experience the experience of hearing so from this dimension phenomenology studies conscious experiences as experienced from the subjective or first person point of view this experiential or first person future that is that of being experienced is an essential part of the nature or structure of conscious experience remember that remember that it, it is it is hard to think of an experience outside the conscious mind when the mind is conscious the mind is conscious of something that thing becomes the object of that consciousness and it is in other words the object of the experience which um we have so it is it's, it's important that we have we 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 have this um, in mind i am emphasizing here on phenomenology as a discipline when we talk about phenomenology as a discipline we are referring to phenomenology as a study of the structures of consciousness the structures of our experiences of course when i talk about the structures of consciousness i am talking about our experiences based on the fact that to be conscious is to be conscious of something and that thing becomes the object of our experience so it it is as a discipline it is the meaning that we give to experiences the experience that you have is not a meaningless kind of thing you try to give some meaning to it as an individual as a person so that meaning that you attribute um to the experiences day to day experiences which you have helps to um to shape phenomenology as as a discipline so i am i am emphasizing consciousness i am emphasizing the first person aspect and then the nature of it the nature of it the nature of it could be now as i as i make as i mentioned already it could be sight it could be hearing it could be um perception mental perception or something so the second distinction which is important for us to make is phenomenology as a philosophical movement you remember as i said initially phenomenology can be a discipline or it is a discipline and a philosophical movement as a philosophical movement phenomenology is situated within the 20th century philosophical trend it is a 20th century philosophical trend uh, developed by by Edmund Husserl I, I I said that already and that uh, movement phenomenology was considered in that movement phenomenology was considered as the foundation of philosophy you see various philosophers attempt to define philosophy the starting point of philosophy the bedrock of philosophy from their own philosophical affiliation or perspective for instance um, according to aristotle um ontology that's metaphysics is the bedrock is is the foundation of of philosophy according to um Emmanuel Levinas, uh, for instance, it is not metaphysics that is the starting point um, or the foundation of uh, philosophy, but the, the the base of philosophy to Levinas is ethics. 
uh, I think we, we can as well see this in that um, short document which I shared with you initially. Um, that is the introduction to phenomenology by um, Demot Moran, where Levinas um, considers um, what we're referring to as the phenomenology of identity to say that the starting point of of uh, philosophy is the ethical question, not a metaphysical question. How does my being justify myself? That's what um, Levinas raises there. How does my being justify myself? And argues that uh, from this perspective, the the base of philosophy cannot be um, metaphysics, but um, ethics. When we, when we come to um, Bertrand Russell, the base is the base is logic or, or epistemology, as as the case could be. And then to Husserl, to Edmund Husserl, the foundation the foundation here is um, is not if I, if I go the via negativa way, the, the the foundation is not ontology, the foundation is not ethics, the foundation of philosophy is not ethics, it is not epistemology, but it is it is um, phenomenology. So it is it is from here that we talk about phenomenology as a philosophical movement, a movement that um, believed that at the base is neither at the base of philosophy, of course, is neither ontology, nor ethics, nor epistemology, nor logic, but phenomenology. And as I've indicated, that um, doctrine started in the 20th century um, with uh, um, Edmund Husserl. So phenomenology is, as a result of this, is one of those three important philosophical movements that dominated the Anglo-Saxon and the Germano-Franco world. So the others, as I as I, as I maintained, are uh, existentialism and then um, analytical um, philosophy, existentialism and analytical philosophy. So. It is it is important that uh, we have these distinctions in mind. Uh, the first, as I, as, I've, as, I, as I maintained in this um, voice note, is to cause us to know that phenomenology is 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 nothing abstract. It's not something abstract. It's not something that um, is restricted only to the to the classroom. It is an everyday activity, as uh, as expatiated from those. Uh, um, examples which I which I left you with five examples which I left you with, and then the, the second is the distinction which we have we have made between um, phenomenology as um, a discipline, and then phenomenology as a philosophical uh, philosophical movement. And then I would like to I would like to equally cause us to understand that the development of uh, phenomenology. It's not just from the 20th century. It's, it, it cannot it cannot be restricted only in the 20th century. There have been attempts. There have been attempts to study um, phenomena. So we can ask the question in this regard: What precipitated this leap, this journey from phenomena to phenomenology, from phenomena to phenomenology one to begin with phenomenology can be loosely defined as a science of phenomena of reality the, the study of of things so in its in its uh, etymological meaning then phenomenology is the study of 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 phenomena that's derived from the greek phenomenon phenomenon meaning appearance so we can we can see it is it is the study of 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 appearances of course reality appears to us reality manifests itself itself to us so in the 18th century phenomenology made the theory of appearances fundamental to empirical knowledge of course we we, we understand we understand that um 17th century and 18th century philosophy um, centered on uh, a, a, an epistemological question. The key theme, the major theme dominating 17th, 18th century philosophy was empirical, was knowledge, epistemology. 
And so within that um, context, um, phenomenology meant the theory of appearances. So if, if, if we reason that the word phenomena um, is derived from the Greek word phenomenon, phenomenon, meaning appearances, then we can understand the 18th century um, perspective or understanding of phenomenology as the theory of appearances, which are fundamental to um, empirical knowledge, especially, especially maybe the sensory, sensory appearances. Of course, we, we, we look at John Locke. John Locke, we can, we can see that um, uh, clearly, because to John Locke, to John Locke, what we what we can be able to get, of course, we can be able to know just experience. Knowledge comes from experience. Knowledge is derived ultimately from experience, particularly sensory sensory um, experiences. So, to John Locke here, substance substance is something that we don't even perceive it we will not be able to perceive it because we cannot be able to sense it that's the context the context in which john locke maintained that um substance is something we know not what we may not be able to sense because he kind of limited um this empirical knowledge to sensory sensory appearances and that's one of the reasons why we'll not be able to we'll not be able to get um knowledge of of a substance so we, we we can we can we can discover that before the 20th century various philosophers have made an effort to study um phenomena to, to study phenomena descartes is one of them that that i want to to to, to comment on him here because descartes in the strict rationalist tradition maintain that what appears before the mind are ideas and that these ideas rationally formed must be clear and distinct what appears before the mind what is of interest here is the word appearance which as i've as i've maintained is the greek word for phenomenon that's phenomena what appears before the mind to john locke are ideas and that from from the rationalist di, uh, standpoint those ideas are clear and distinct remember that an idea is clear when it is before the conscious mind such an idea from the cartesian perspective is is considered to be a clear idea and then an idea is said to be distinct when it is um different um from other ideas so that idea is clear that idea is is distinct then emmanuel kant later on maintained that we can only possess knowledge of phenomena and not the nomina. you know kant kant was of the opinion that we can only know things we can only know things as um they appear that's phenomena but we can never be able to to get to the knowledge of things as they are that's the distinction from the Kantian perspective between the phenomena and the nomina phenomena the meaning appearances of things things as they appear to us and then nomina things as they are then the the latin the latin term phenomenologia phenomenologia helps us a bit here helps us a bit here to understand exactly what we're talking about and it is used in this perspective to that's in the 17th 18th century i beg your pardon 18th century um it's used again as the study the study day of appearances the study of of appearances so subsequently the german term phenomenologia was was used also as well in the same perspective in the same perspective please perhaps you may have to you may have to forgive my 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 german uh, appellation of this but then at least when you get when you get the the handout which um i shared with you already you will be able to get more insights from here 
But then the main thing is that we're dealing here with uh, um, how we were able to, the transition from phenomena to phenomenology, the transition from phenomena to phenomenology. On the one hand, we have had various philosophers who can even stretch right to Plato, to Aristotle, and even come right up to um, the modern period. That's where I choose to start from, the modern era, studying phenomena. We have had that beginning from the um, um, the rationalists. We made mention of Descartes to the empiricist John Locke, to Kant, Emmanuel Kant, who attempted to to synthesize the, the perspectives of the rationalists and, and the empiricists by making a distinction there. Of course, Kant makes a distinction between phenomena and, and nomena, as, as, as I've maintained. And then, of course, we, we later on get the likes of, a, of a Hegel, whose work is the phenomenology of spirit. Phenomenology of spirit. That is to say, that is to say that um, Ed, Edmund Husserl in the 20th century is not the first person to have to have made effort to study um, phenomena. So the 18th and the 19th century epistemology then phenomena considered phenomena as the starting point in the building of knowledge. That's especially the sciences. 18th and 19th century or 18 to 19th century um, epistemology phenomena the study of appearances we considered as a starting point in building knowledge especially science accordingly then phenomena are what we observed what we perceive what we seek to explain. So it's important that we have this in mind, please. Phenomena that is within the context of 18th and 19th century epistemology um, serves as the starting point in the building of knowledge. And when we talk about phenomena here, we're referring to those things that we observed, those things that we perceive, those things which we seek um to explain and therefore from this modern period of philosophy edmund husserl took the term for his science of consciousness because husserl's approach to phenomenology is studying the structures of consciousness the study of the structures of consciousness as experience from the first person point of view so it is it is thanks to the 18th and the 19th century um, understanding of, of phenomena as starting point in building knowledge especially the knowledge that has to do with the sciences that Husserl developed his um, science of consciousness that's either from the observation, either from the perception, or either the consciousness from the things which we seek to explain. And the study of the structures of this consciousness is what Husserl refers to as phenomenology. So we, we, can, we can conveniently be able to answer the question how phenomenology developed from the study of phenomena. So this particular this particular um, this particular audio um, today is looking at a general introduction to to phenomenology, and we started we started by indicating that phenomenology is an everyday activity, and that is that is justified or that was justified by the by some examples which I gave to you, and then we later on made a distinction between um, phenomenology as a discipline and phenomenology as a philosophical movement and then finally we have seen um, the transition the transition from the study of phenomena to phenomenology that's in other words how can we justify the movement from phenomena the transition 
the going beyond the study of phenomena to phenomenology that's that's basically um um what we have done and if we, if we're able to get this if we're able to get this today then we can we can say for sure that we have we have understood what we have or what we are referring to here as the general um introduction to to phenomenology i think the the, the next um series will be will be consecrated to the definition of definition of phenomenology because at least listening to me you'll be able to um to place a finger at least from the historical point of view where we are when we talk about um phenomenology that's 20th century philosophy and the other philosophical trends that we are prominent within this part within this particular um period thank you very much and i wish you the best